This is Filling the Sink, a podcast from Catalan News. My name is Lucia Benavides, and today we're talking about Catalan painter and sculptor Antoni Tapias. <laughs> This week marks a hundred years since the birth of one of Catalonia's most renowned artists of the 20th century. Antoni Tapias is best known for his abstract art and avant-garde works, which have been displayed in museums all over the world, from Barcelona to New York to Paris. In this episode, we'll hear from museum curators on why Tapia's work is still relevant and get an intimate look into the artist's home life from Tapia's very own son. Here with me today is reporter Killian Shields. Hi, Killian. Hello, Lucia. How are you? I'm good. Uh, excited to talk about this artist whose uh, work I don't know much about, so uh, yeah, me excited too, to learn. Me too. <laughs> I've gotten to know him a lot better now, having done the research for this. I bet, I bet. So let's start with the basics, because you know some of our listeners may not know who Antoni Tapias is. Can you tell us who was Antoni Tapias? Why is he important still a hundred years after his birth? Yeah, sure. Well, he was born in Barcelona on December 13th, 1923. So we've just mm -hmm. had the centenary of his birth. And that is why we're speaking about him today. But yeah. it's also why we're seeing so many kind of events commemorating his life, his work, his achievements all throughout Catalonia and Barcelona, especially over the next couple of months and the Tapia's year in his foundation as well. Oh, nice. I think he's as well so kind of emblematic with the Catalan capital. It's because... Well, one, he was born here, but also, two, he really is of the city. He spent all of his life here. Mm -hmm. he, he really drove the culture forward here in a way that many other artists didn't. I mean, he's really de barna de toda la vida. Yeah, and I also read that he grew up in an environment, you know, exposed to culture, social leaders. His father was a lawyer and a Catalan politician who served on the Republican government, yeah, right? Exactly. During the Second Republic. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so he came definitely from... Uh, like a well-to-do family, but obviously this kind of gave him exposure to kind of cultural sides, which he, he was then able to go and study. Right. Uh, a sort of a world that obviously not all of us are privileged enough to, to really be able yeah. to explore. But yeah, it's definitely helped grow his brain at a, at a formative time and definitely. made yeah. him the man that he became. So how is his childhood, all this exposure he had um, reflected in his art? Yeah, um, that's that's a good question. I suppose if you're to talk about his artwork, you could probably say that his 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 pieces are not the most immediately beautiful. Uh, by that I mean they require active participation uh, mm -hmm. from the onlooker, from the audience, to 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 really quote unquote get the right, art piece. Right. Um, they're not like a Picasso or a Jean Miro, which are they might have like very striking colors yeah. that might be trying to represent something that you can identify and you yeah. can see that it's beautiful in, a, in an immediate sense. Yeah. Anthony Tapia's his work is a lot more conceptual, shall we say, mm -hmm. uh, definitely requires your own kind of uh, interpretation. And he definitely demanded your own active participation in to mm -hmm. really understand it. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose one of the main headline things about his art as well, if we're kind of get into describing what yeah, it actually yeah. is. Yeah, let's hear what, is, it, is, what is it looks like. That question of what it is, um, that's quite interesting because it's not paint. You, There is paint used, but it's he uses matter. So okay. he uses a lot of physical objects, uh, which yeah. he sometimes mm, lets stand as a sculpture or, or, or it could be like, melanges of marble dust um, well, yeah. or, or all sorts of like wood or, or different sort of materials yeah it's, it's very not, yeah. matter was his, right was his main it's <laughs> not the traditional like canvas paint exactly or no, no, canvas no. Um, and he does yeah. use a bit of paint but definitely his, his works are 3d essentially it's not right. just a painting it's a it's a thing that really pops out of it yeah because it's literally materials yeah <laughs> i guess that's what makes him uh, he's usually described as a painter slash sculptor mm -hmm. so i'm assuming it's kind of a like unique sort of thing that's sort of in between those yeah. kind of ideas right like a matter one or the artist. other yeah, yeah. yeah i saw one 
piece that was like two chairs mounted on a canvas and it's they're not even full chairs they're like half chairs and mm -hmm. I think there's some paint around them yeah yeah exactly exactly yeah so it's this kind of thing that it's it's going to require a little bit of interpretation on your right. part as well to understand right <laughs> right right and i know you went to the fundacio antoni tapia so let's hear a little bit of what you found there It's difficult to overstate the place that Anthony Tapies holds within Catalan society nearly 14 years after his death and 100 years on from his birth. He is one of the greatest artists to ever emerge from this land and few have done more than he has to push boundaries and drive Catalan culture forward. Well, Tapies uh, is a reference in Catalonia so it's uh, without any uh, doubt one of the biggest names of, uh, of Catalonia worldwide. I know a lot of people that they think that the foundation and also Tapias is, is, a, is one of the essence of, uh, of our culture. That's Pep Vidal, curator of the exhibition A equals A, B equals B, open now at the Tapias Foundation in Barcelona. Antoni Tapias was very interested in science in general and, and you can feel it in a lot of uh, his works that they are uh, related with uh, some scientific approach and the, the aim of the exhibition is um, to talk about this interest in, in the science and how uh, science is uh, touching a lot of uh, different uh, fields. Tapies was a very learned individual, a lover of books and music. An illness at a young age left him hospitalised with little else to do but read and think about life in a profound way. This period changed his life forever, as he came out of it thinking about life, about society, about reality in a completely new way. He was a, like a very hard work, so he was uh, working all the day in the studios. He, he was uh, approaching from the different points of view. So I think that he was a, a, an artist from his time because he was very in interested and very touched with the things that were happening at, at that time. But also he was like uh, working with, with concepts that uh, they are totally contemporary, you know, like time or matter or numbers or... The, philosophy of, of the Zen. No? So it's as well as science, Tapies was fascinated by spirituality, especially oriental teachings. His interest in Zen Buddhism is explored in the exhibition curated by Nuria Oms. But I would define the Tapies as a way to teach us to the reality. I would define the work of Tapias as a way to look at reality. Tapias asked for an active attitude from the spectator of his art, for the spectator to complete the work by looking at it with their own baggage and their own experience. In fact, this idea is at the heart of the work of the Buddhist monks of the 17th to 19th centuries that Tapias was so interested by. These Buddhist monks used art, Chinese paintings and calligraphy to transmit the teachings of Buddhist Zen. The artist's ability to expand horizons ensured he will forever go down as one of the key figures in the second half of the 20th century in Catalonia. Tapias represented the return to modernity after the Civil War. He represented the resumption of modernity. Tapias' international success and his contact with the world outside Spain helped so that artists who displayed their work abroad could display it here. He acted as a bridge. One could spend days debating and discussing the lifetime of work of Anthony Tapies, but for anyone interested but unsure where to start, a visit to the Tapies Foundation is surely a good bet. I will invite the people to, to come to the Foundation to see both exhibitions because I think that both they are also very related. The scale is totally different and the, a lot of uh, the approach is very, very close. Thank you to Pep Vidal and Nuria Oms for speaking with us. So, Killian, can you describe a bit the building itself that the Fundacio Antoni Tapies is in? Because I've seen it walking around and it definitely stands out. For sure, absolutely. Uh, I actually still remember the first time that I saw it. Um, 
it's it's kind of one that stops you in your tracks and you know kind of makes you think about it for a second yeah much like his art you might say oh, for sure um, yeah but just off Passage de Gracia I, I definitely remember when I was visiting Barcelona for the first time in between the two big uh, Gaudí buildings there Casa Bayo and uh, La Pedrera I think um, it's on Aragó right Carrer yeah. Aragó yeah but just so when you're on Passage de Gracia you if, if you look it. to the yeah. left that's that's how I saw it for the first time and I saw this building with sort of on top of the building that had this huge like kind of wiry steely metallic sort of cloud on top of it yeah and that makes you think like what is that yeah um so that's the kind of thing that kind of first strikes you when you when you first notice the building yeah and yeah and the building itself it's it's gorgeous it's made by the architect Juiz Domenech Montaner Mm -hmm. one of Catalonia's most famous architects who also has his own anniversary coming up oh yeah and (laughs) yeah it's got space for for a few different exhibitions and a huge library in the back then as well and yeah and so they have I'm assuming a lot of his work there what what can if someone visits the Fundacion what will they see they'll see the two exhibitions that are on at the moment that we just Uh heard about I don't think they have a permanent exhibition like uh, something showing at all times so it'll just be whatever's rotating at that time okay okay so going back to Antoni Tapia's art um we talked a little bit about, you know, you described that he uses a lot of uh, material, texture. Mm-hmm. Um, matter painting, yeah. Matter painting, exactly. So how how would you describe his art style? Like, did he belong mm-hmm. to any artistic movement of the time? Yeah, well, that's a very interesting question because it's he's quite difficult to define, in fact. Uh-huh. Uh, did, he, did he belong to any particular movement? Well, he kind of started out with surrealism. I think he was probably born right at the perfect time to be influenced by the likes of Picasso, Dali, Miro. Uh, they were all just from his own country, but then also André Breton, Robert Ernst, uh, René Magritte. These were all huge at the time that he was first learning about art. So he was hugely influenced by this and sort of started out with that. But he definitely wasn't a surrealist for his career. He right. pretty much moved away from that into his own very distinct, very contemporary his own abstract style, which really incorporates kind of scratches, marks on material, textured canvases, sculptures, mixed media. Um, And this, like, it's very difficult to kind of put him in a category with any other artist because uh, there's very few that you can compare him to um, because he was doing all of this at a time that, I mean, if you look at his art pieces today, they look like they could just as easily be made today yeah. by a contemporary artist. Definitely. Um, they look so fresh, so so new, so, yeah, groundbreaking, amazing. Yeah. Uh, but it's very difficult to kind of like pin him down with uh, definitions, words, yeah. categories, you or know? Or compare him to other people at the time. Uh, exactly, yeah, He was doing yeah. his own thing. Yeah, exactly, which, which is... kind of makes him even, even more kind of admirable, kind right. of really makes him stand out even more. Right, definitely. And I read somewhere that this is kind of, a bizarre thing but something that he used a lot in his paintings is socks or he used it to create art i guess to paint uh yeah is that right paint isn't exactly the word or, because yeah. he used literal socks he didn't paint socks he used physical socks okay. and attached them onto his his art pieces but not oh. just socks sort of everyday objects that's kind of the the relevance of the sock here an yeah. everyday object that you know, you or I, presumably we're both wearing socks right now. Uh, it's but cold, yes. Presumably <laughs> most people listening are yeah. as well. And socks are a thing that they have such an importance in all of our lives where pretty much everyone's wearing them, but pretty much nobody pays any attention to them. Yeah, so they're kind of that boring yeah. article of clothing that you have Exactly, to have. <laughs> yeah. but that's still hugely important. Yeah. Without them, yes, we may be able to get from A to B, but we wouldn't manage to do so in nearly as comfortable a fashion. Yes. So... <laughs> And on top of that, usually when they're like a little bit damaged, if there's a tiny rip in them, we'll throw them out without any Mm -hmm. consideration. So Tapia sort of subverts the role of this humble everyday object by giving it a huge place of importance, placing socks directly onto his art pieces. You know, kind of showing us that it's this thing that nobody thinks about, but it's actually hugely important. As well as socks, you mentioned chairs as well earlier on. Chairs are... Uh, another very common aspect of his art piece is that he, you know, even if they're damaged, broken, ripped apart, he'll kind of place it centrally in the art piece and just kind of make us think about these everyday things in a new way. Oh, that's super interesting. Mm. Yeah. Another common motif that's worth mentioning as well that he uses very often in his artworks is this symbol of the cross. 
Uh, like I said mm-hmm. before, his mother was f- quite religious. So obviously growing up in, in Franco Spain, religion was omnipresent. Right. So Tapia saw profound meaning in this symbol, but not in a directly kind of Catholic, institutionalized, religious way. Yeah. Um, he saw much more in it. He saw that it can represent the, the north, south, east, west coordinate points of the world. But also he saw the earthly in the horizontal plane and the spiritual in the vertical plane. So this connection between the earth and spirituality, which is another thing, yeah. obviously, that he explored in his artwork yeah. w- without being explicitly religious himself. But he was definitely spiritual in another way. Right, right. And again, the influence from his childhood that we talked about earlier reflected in his art. Mm-hmm. And you were saying, yeah, him using these kind of, you know, humble objects, it it reminded me of what I read about his family life. Like he was a very kind of down to earth, humble man. He was married once mm-hmm. as opposed to yep. sometimes artists were married various times. He was married once, had three children. He didn't have a very scandalous life like a lot of artists do or, or did have in the past. Yeah, exactly. He was just a humble family man who just liked to get his head down and get on with his work and mm-hmm. worked hard at that. Um, in fact, I believe one of his sons, Mikel, actually was one of his assistants in the studio for a oh, long time. Yeah. But to get a better picture of the family life that they all led, I paid a visit to Tony Tapies, uh, Anthony Tapies' other son, uh, in his office in Barcelona. Sometimes people said, oh, he was very angry or very uh, serious. But in fact, uh, he, he was very, very normal, very lovely. And of course, he was very, very interested in, in his paintings. So children were there, but uh, it was basically my mother who played with us. And he was much of his time in the studio or then you know, listening to music uh, or, or reading. Uh, During summers was when yeah. young Tony got to spend most time with his father when they retreated to their country home in the Monsen Massif, a rural part of the world that had a tremendous influence on the artist, where he worked in the mornings and spent time with the family in the afternoons. We, we had lunch together every day, supper together every day, so I had the chance to speak a lot with my father. I learned uh, a lot from him, um, so he, he, ha- he has never been uh, an extravagant person, so it, it would be very difficult to, to make a film on his life, <laughs> because uh, it, must, it should be quite boring, I think. You can do a film about Picasso, but not about Tapies. <laughs> Anthony Tapies worked in different home studios where the family lived during different periods, giving young Tony the chance to witness his father working up close from a very young age. Uh, sometimes he allowed me to enter into the studio because he, he didn't like somebody being there looking at what he, he was doing. Uh, but when I was a little child, sometimes, not, not frequently, but sometimes, he, I asked him, can I go inside? Okay, come. And he gave me some, some colors and some cardboards and he said, yeah, do, do something here. And he was working there and I was just drawing in a little corner. And it, it was fine and I have a good memory of that. Then later, this studio in the house w- was uh, too small for him. And uh, they built a, a, a much bigger studio outside, close to the house, but outside, not in the house. And then there he had more intimacy to to work. Tony Tapies wasn't aware of his father's relevance in the art world when he was a child. But eventually he started to realize as he got a bit older. When I was a teenager, uh, he began to be quite successful and uh, journalists came to do interviews and maybe the TV also. Uh, I think then I, I realized and... You, you know, it, it's not easy being that a child of uh, a great artist. And at the beginning I thought, oh, I have to do something important also. And um, I began writing when I was very young, se- 17, 18. And I began writing poetry. And since then I've published around eight books of poetry in Catalan. Tony studied medicine and worked as a doctor for years, but eventually came to realize that that was not his calling. 
and probably I studied medicine to do something very <laughs> different. Uh, but at the end, you see, I came back <laughs> and I run a gallery. The Gallery at Tony Tapies manages much of the estate of Anthony Tapies and has displayed the work of up and coming artists in the past. The entity currently doesn't have a gallery space open to visit, but continues to work on the estate of the legendary artist. Thank you to Tony Tapias for speaking with us. So we talked a little bit about Tapia's historical context. He was creating art during Francisco Franco's dictatorship and then also after the transition to democracy. But we didn't talk much about his politics. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how he included his politics in his art? Yeah, I mean, that's also a huge part of Tapia's work. Uh, he was a huge defender of, of Catalonia, Catalan values. We can see the colors and the design scheme of the Catalan flag very frequently in his paintings and his drawings and his mm -hmm. prints. Tony Tapia has also told me that his father was always a great defender of the Catalan country, the Catalan culture, the Catalan language. Right. And this fight was always very present in his work. Because, yeah. um, well, we have to think the period of the dictatorship Tony Tapia has described it as, as terrible, not only in terms of freedom, but, but also cultural life. Right. Um, he said that it was kind of like living in a prison. So for Anthony Tapia, the artist, when he went abroad, when he went to Paris or Germany or the United States, when he was exhibiting or, or even yeah. just visiting, um, he could make a very clear contrast with life there where he was visiting and then back at home in, in Barcelona, in Spain. So right. this naturally kind of like expanded his own horizons politically. He saw what was possible and yeah. he kind of brought that back home and tried to, in every way that he could, he just tried to spread these values of democracy. He was actually arrested at one stage at a very oh, important wow. meeting in the, uh, the a church in Barcelona, the Capuchins de Saria. Uh, uh -huh. There were many intellectuals and students there. The police surrounded it um, and everyone was arrested there. Uh, Tapia spent three days in prison, in fact. Um, as well, Nuria Oms, the, the exhibitor who we heard from earlier on, she also describes to me that uh, Tapies would often use his work to either donate it so that it could be auctioned and this would then, the money would be used to pay fines, like political fines that, that dissents would be given for, you know, political reasons. Uh, right. He would often use his own money to pay some of these fines as well. Um, so, yeah, like a lot of his work is, is very political. Politics were a huge part of his life. And, uh, you know, just the same way that we see spiritualism, uh, we also see modern politics in his work also. It's time now, not necessarily for the Catalan phrase of the week, because we're going to change it up a little bit today. So I guess I should say it's time now to hear a quote by the man of the hour, Antoni Tapias. Um, he, like we said, he was a well-read person, so I'm sure he had many interesting things to say about his art and about life. Yeah, he did. Absolutely. Absolutely. I found this in the obituary of him when he died in the New York Times. So it is going to be in English. Uh, and what he said at the opening of the Tapias Foundation in 1990 was... My illusion is to have something to transmit. If I can't change the world, at least I want to change the way people look at it. That's all we have time for today. Thank you, Killian, for being here. And thank you to everyone who spoke with us for this episode. We'll be back next Saturday with another episode of Filling the Sink. In the meantime, you can catch Catalan News on social media or email us at fillingthesink at acn.cat. On behalf of the entire team here, I'm Lucia Benavides, wishing you a wonderful weekend. Goodbye, ciao, adeu. Mm -hmm.